Um, I need to make a video. Uh, not only just because of what happened to my video that I released yesterday, but also because I feel like I need to make one. So, what happened yesterday was I uploaded a video about my graduation. It was called Fear and Loathing on the Graduation Trail. But it was after accumulating almost 200 views, it got taken down illegally and against YouTube copyright guidelines. It was taken down because for five seconds you could briefly see the face of, of the person who was DJing our graduation party. Now, I have several reasons to dislike this person. Not only because he got us kicked out of our own graduation. He did something that got us kicked out, so that's incredibly unprofessional. And on top of that, he went to one of to the video that was supposed to be commemor commemorating our year and the times we spent together, and he took it down because he's selfish and didn't want his face in it for five seconds. But on top of that, he didn't file a privacy policy claim. Because if he had filed that, I would have been completely fine, and I would have taken it down, because that's one thing. No, he filed a copyright claim, which is not how copyright works, especially on YouTube. And on top of that, he didn't do it. A third party did it, which is, again, against the, the guidelines. So that's several ways he's broken it now. And he refused to, to go through the proper channels, so I had to take the video down. Well, it's not taken down, it's unlisted, and I've had to re-upload another version with a special message to him in the place where his face was. Now, I forwarded this onto Gator the Legend, who does small tuber news, and hopefully he'll make this more aware to the wider, peop the wider um, you know, YouTube uh, um, community, I suppose. And I've already tweeted at um, Team YouTube and everything. But I basically, I just want to spread the word that don't let Sam Walsh DJ your parties, and also he's a cowardly prick. What I should be doing right now is studying for my leaving search because as I don't know if a lot of you know in Ireland we have something called the leaving cert which is like the big test for all your college choices and I should really be studying but I also wanted to make a video so I thought why not combine them together and I'm going to make a video on how Edmund Gloucester is not the bad guy in King Lear. King Lear is my Shakespearean play that I'm doing for my leaving cert. And I'm going to be basically reading off of an essay I did that um, is my opinion on why he is not the villain in King Lear in any way, shape, or form. Um, I was looking at pictures for Edmund, and I kind of realized they're all a bit like this, very Renaissance, which, um, no, not at all. Oh, by the way, I'm recording this afterwards on my computer, so sorry for bad audio quality. No, they wouldn't be like this. They'd be more like this. Because Lear is supposed to take in place 3000 BC. I mean, uh, 800 BC, sorry, not 3000, Jesus. But no, they they would look, be, look, they'd be Celts. They look more like this. Not like foppish Renaissance men. Silly, silly, silly. I think I'm going to make a whole nother video about the awful his historical accuracy in a lot of Shakespeare's plays. But for now, let's get back to the proper video about... Edmund not being the bad guy in King Lear. Now, the statement of this essay is that Gloucester's sons represent the best and worst in humanity. Now, I agree with this statement 100%, just not the way you'd think I would. Edmund represents, like, drive and tenacity and intelligence, whereas... And, and the, ability, the ability to overcome his circumstances of his birth, whereas Edgar just represents ignorance. Specifically, like, the ignorance of one's privilege. For me, the best parts of humanity, the human story, is our struggle. The struggle we as humans inevitably go through, whether your struggle in your uh, career, in your life, lives, be it personal or uh, career, like I already mentioned. But we struggle for uh, equality, and we struggle to have... Like, we have a certain amount of ingenuity to be able to succeed. The ambition to see a goal and think, I should have that, and then actually going out and getting that thing that you wanted. Rising in the totem pole, succeeding in the rat race, breaking the rat, way, rat race, breaking the wheel, breaking the cycle, succeeding, breaking the mold. And Edmund, Edmund represents this breaking of the wheel of regimes and, and doing things ways that people just hadn't thought of before. 
From when Edmund is first introduced in the play, we know him as Gloucester's bastard. He Gloucester brags about how much it, how much fun it was creating Edmund, and how despite him being away for most of his life, Gloucester still claims to love Edmund as an equal. And he also says it doesn't matter that he's illegitimate because he has a a legitimate son. 12 months older than him anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Now look at this from Ed Edmund's perspective. You've never known your father or mother growing up. You've always just been alone. And you, you have aspirations that eventually one of them is going to come back and bring you in. But you get home and father you've been imagining for your whole life insults you, insults your mother and says, it's okay that you're inferior. I have someone better than you anyway. This reminds you that through no fault of your own, you are so much more base than your brother. So much less legitimate. And Edmund says in his own monologue, if I allow me to quote, Wherefore bastard? Wherefore base? He makes the point that, if anything, he should be more legitimate because he was born out of love. And he kind of implies that Edgar was born out of a stilted, arranged marriage. But, and he has the he has the drive to take what he he thinks he rightfully deserves something he knows should not be able to happen due to the corrupt and evil society that he lives in that he was born into through no fault of his own then Edmund has the intelligence and the guile to remove Edgar from the whole equation he does this with his very clever letter and uh, self-harming ruse but then we do we come to the thing that a lot of people, think is the worst, one of the worst things Edmund did, which was betray Gloucester to Cornwall and Regan. I don't see that as betrayal, uh, because if you recall, Lear is currently a traitor to the crown. Um, he's suspected of corroborating with the French, and the only other time Edmund has seen Lear, or heard Lear, was in the first scene, where he does the thing. He uh, banishes Cordelia. And when he finds out, not only is Gloucester betraying the crown, he's doing it, and it can benefit Edmund, and Edmund can do more. So not only is he doing the right thing in accordance to the crown, he's doing the best thing for him. And he betrays Gloucester and hands him off to Cornwall and Regan. Then Gloucester's punishment happens, which I don't think Edmund could have foreseen. Now, a lot of people will argue with me about this, but Edmund probably guessed imprisonment, maybe a little bit of torture. He pr didn't guess blinding, mainly because the blinding seems very rushed. The second eye probably wasn't going to come out. They took out the one eye and then the stabbing, the servants attacking Cornwall, that happens. Then they take out the other eye. So I don't think the, 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 the eye gouging was planned from the beginning and it's just something Edmund couldn't have foreseen. Sorry, there's a tractor full of silage coming down. It's the problem with living in rural Ireland. Edmund has now become Earl of Gloucester. He has set out to get the thing he wanted, and he has gotten the title that he wanted. A bastard with no lands or titles to his name has risen to an earlship in weeks. But then he sees both the daughters of Lear that remain in Britain both have an immense lust for him. He doesn't really show love for either of them, but he plays... The lust off of each, he plays the lustful sisters off of each other. And how I imagine it working in his head is, why not rise? You can see the debauchery and the evil in the system. Why not rise and take control over all of it? I mean, he was probably marrying, planning on marrying one, getting the other one to kill that one, marrying the other, and then becoming king of all of England. Well, Britain. He has enough intelligence to make a great ruler, that's for certain. He would have been better than Lear, probably would have been better than uh, either of the dukes. Um, he obviously has great battle and strategic, battle prowess and strategic leadership ability, as Regan gives him um, credit for beating the French in the final battle, which I think I'm going to make another video about how I imagine that battle would have gone, considering the time period this is supposed to take place pre-Roman invasion Britain. So they would have been Celts or Britons. Hmm. Odd to think about that.
Shakespeare's really weird with time periods. And yes, he does lose a duel against Edward Edgar, but I'm going to talk about that in my Edgar section because that duel was not fought on equal ground, let's put it like that. Actually, I'm gonna also make another video about Edgar being the villain. Well, not being a villain, but just not being as heroic as he's presented. Now, I'm not arguing that Edgar did do a lot of things that were morally grey, to say the least. I think the worst thing he did was sentence Lear and Cordelia to death. Now, you could argue that they were the head of uh, an enemy uh, invading army, and you should have had them killed, but even then, looking at it from Shakespearean times and the time when the play is set, you just wouldn't do that. You'd either enslave them in the other case, for as far as I know, or you'd keep them prisoner. Shakespearean case. As far as I know, I might be, I'm, I'm not that much of a expert on that specific topic of what they would do to prisoners, but I'm, and I'm more putting a, like a, like a slightly later idea onto it, but either way, killing them would not have been what I would expect him to do. But even then, he does then apologize for that later on. But despite this, Edmund would have been the best bet for Britain. Um, the end of the play is kind of meant to imply that Britain is divided. Kent won't take a place as king because Lear has died. Albany is unsure and Edgar say, stays silent, or more accurately says something to the... I can't remember the exact quote, but it's something along the lines of, let's not talk about this now. And it's completely... Und it's completely divided up and not unified, and that ooh, this was meant to be a semi-propaganda piece for James the uh, First. James the First, James Stewart, had re just recently come to power. This was first performed at a New Year's Day party for him, and it was this was meant to be a propaganda piece because he was uniting the whole island of Britain, and this play shows the dangers of Britain being disunited, because some people say this, I'm not sure how I feel about this, some people say the end of this play is supposed to imply that Britain is undivided and that's how they were captured by the Roman, uh, captured, conquered by the Romans, which I'm not sure how I feel about that, it's very oorah, Britain, 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 the Romans were pretty tough. But they would have been better off with Edmund, because Edmund would have united the country and he would have been strong, he would have been a strong leader, and he would have been an intelligent leader and a competent leader. Edmund was not the bad guy in King Lear. He just wasn't. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about the right to rule thing. In Shakespearean times, it was the right of the son of a lord to rule. Um, it was kind of like a divine right. Specific, that was more for kings, but it was, it was pretty much acknowledged that if you were someone's son, you are meant to rule. Whereas now we're supposed to live in a meritocracy where everyone strives to be the best and the people that are the best rise to the top. In Shakespearean time, someone trying to break the cycle of uh, succession would have been seen as just wrong. So for a Shakespearean audience, Edmund is immediately the villain because he's breaking that cardinal rule. Whereas for us, he's not because he's rising above it, and for modern audiences to still see him as a villain is just wrong in my opinion. Maybe lots of people feel like this, I don't know, but I've had lots of arguments in my English class about this, and a lot of people disagree with me. I'd love to hear about you, how you talk about it, talk to me on Twitter about it, talk to me about it in the comments, share this video, like and subscribe. More uh, discussion videos like this coming because I want to... I've, it's good for me to study. I feel like it helps me grasp the texts a lot better by discussing them, and also it means I'm getting content out. So, like and subscribe, see you next video, never hire Sam With lips of pearly white teeth I don't show it but I quiver whenever you come near And I cannot decipher between the thrill and the fear I wanna